reading today. Luke chapter number 9, we'll be looking at verses 46 through verse number 62. 46 through 62 of Luke chapter number 9. We are in the uh, process of going through the life of Christ. I call it a biography of Jesus. And so as we look through the life of Jesus, we understand more and more of how we ought to live and specifically uh, by seeing what Jesus does, but also by seeing what his disciples do at all. So we'll be looking through that today. Verse number 46 is where we're going to pick it up at today. Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest. And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me receiveth them that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. And John an, uh, answered and said, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and we forbade him, because he followeth not with us. And Jesus said unto him, Forbid him not. For he is not against us, is for us. And it, is, and it came to pass, when the time was come that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went, and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. And when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. And they went to another village. And it came to pass that as they went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And he said unto another, Follow me. But he said, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said unto him, Let the be dead bury their dead. But go thou and preach the kingdom of God. And another also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid thee farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto him, No man, having put his hand to the plow, and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on uh, the message. Dearly Father, we thank you so much for giving us your word. How faithful it is to show us the things of our heart. Father, may you use it as the sword of the Spirit in our lives today to understand our, our disposition, our thoughts, our motives. And may you help us to do all that you would have us to do in this life. Father, may you rebuke those who need rebuked, encourage those who need to be encouraged. And Father, may you just teach us of your glorious doctrines and your glorious instructions for righteousness, that we may be equipped, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Fill me with your spirit, help me bring forth the message, I do pray. In Jesus' name, amen. There are two types of people in the world. Those who like tests and those who don't. I don't know which one you are. If you, at school, you're like, all right, it's test time. Okay, bring it on. I have studied for this. I am ready for this. I am going to do well on this test. Some would say, that is not me whatsoever. <laughs> Some would say, no, if, if I just pass the test, I'm okay. But I, I cringe to get to that test. 
to see the questions that I probably have not studied. I see the questions that I'm not ready to answer, especially if it's essay. Oh boy, that, you, you could try to get your way through that, but if it's true and false, you've got 50% chance that you might be right and 50% chance you might be wrong. Multiple choice, you've got a 25% chance that you are correct. Me, I liked school. I really enjoyed school. Uh, when I went to college, I loved a lot of different classes. And the reason why I would love them was because I could anticipate what to study to emphasize in my study in order to get a good grade. One class I, I studied, and I could not believe my eyes at the results. I had 100%. And I thought, there must be a mistake somewhere in my test. I asked my teacher about it. He's like, no, no, you did, did quite well. You, you just replicated every note that I gave you. So there you go. You got 100. I'm like, yeah, praise the Lord. There was one class, though, that I still am upset about today. <laughs> I'm still upset with this one class. And that was, it's called Genesis Foundations. One half of the class was meant for, okay, understanding the Bible, Genesis 1 through Genesis 11. Get an understanding the foundation of the Bible as well as foundation of the history of the world. And you go through creation. You go through uh, the catastrophic uh, flood of the, with the ark. And then you get to the table of nations to see where all the people groups came from. Wonderful portion of that class. The other half of that class was reading. You had to read a lot of, well, thick books about scientifically proven how we can say that Genesis is correct. One such, uh, one such book was called uh, uh, Genesis, The Genesis Flood. And it is 489 pages of nothing but scientific thinking. And I understand probably 20% of it. So going through and reading those books, I thought, okay, well, I, I hope I'm not tested on that. The first test that we had, we had two tests in that class. One test was the midterms. So I'm like, all right, got to study all my notes. And I did quite well with that. I think I got a, a minus. Okay. But then came the final. I'm like, well, I'll just go ahead and read through my notes again, get, emphasize my notes over and over again until I really get it. Well, I really got that information. But when I got to the test, it's 100 questions, 50 questions on what I studied, 50 questions all about the book. And I didn't remember a single thing about the book. I pulled off a C, I think it was a C minus, uh, for that test itself, but I was so upset that I emphasized the wrong things to get 100% on the test. Likewise, for us, if we emphasize the wrong things in our lives, then we, it would be quite a, a tragedy in our life that we emphasized the wrong things. In our text today, we're looking at uh, the disciples and what they emphasize, which were the wrong things. Jesus rebukes every single one of them because they had the wrong emphasis here. So first we're going to look at, and we're, so we're going to understand and think to ourselves, do we have this emphasis, or are we more and more like Jesus in what he emphasized? First of all, we're going to see uh, that the wrong emphasis is emphasis, first of all, on ourselves rather than others. Ourselves and how important we are rather than the importance of others. Notice with me what it says in the text. This is right after uh, the transfiguration. He came down off the mount. He now healed the, 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 the child uh, that was demon-possessed. Now everybody's wondering. Notice with me in verse number 45, uh, no, 43. Let's back up a little bit. And they were all amazed at the mighty power of God. They were all, wow, isn't this amazing? This kid was once a uh, epileptic. He was once having seizures all the time. He is once demon-possessed, but now Christ himself has healed that child. Wow! Isn't God amazing? Here's what Jesus has to say now. Uh, but while they, were, they wandered, everyone at all things which Jesus did, he said unto his disciples, 
Let these saying sink down into your ears, for the Son of Man shall be delivered into the hands of men. Once again, after the great confession of Peter, Jesus is referring, revealing to his disciples the very fact that he was going to die. And just about every single time that he gives an utterance about his death, uh, future death on the cross, he gives a little more information to that. That's the reason for him coming, is for him to die. And then, verse 45, But they understood not this saying, and it was hid from them, and that they received it not, and they feared to ask him of that saying. So they didn't understand. The disciples were like, um, okay, you say you're going to be delivered into the hands of men. We don't really understand. They're still having the idea that Jesus is going to become the king. He is going to bring in and usher in the kingdom of Israel back into the forefront that the world will be conquered by Jesus himself. Now, they're right about that, just not at this point in time. In the future, we're still looking forward to the coming of Christ, where he's going to right every wrong, where he's going to set up his own kingdom here on the planet Earth. And we praise the Lord that that's going to happen. Praise the Lord that He is going to reign with righteousness. And we're going to be along with the right if we have put our faith on Jesus Christ. But they understand this is the time that He's going to do that, but they're wrong. He's going to die. But then right after this, it's very interesting what happens. Their discussion after this is not them discussing with each other, hey, what do you think Jesus meant by that? let's talk about something else Jesus said. Let's talk about other things that, that he has done and, and just glorify him and glorify God. No, they go, verse 46, Then there arose a reasoning among them, which of them should be greatest? Oh, <laughs> we're not talking about Jesus. We're not talking about, oh, what do you think he meant? I don't know, but I, I sure am wonderful. <laughs> Did you see what I saw? Man, I saw Jesus do this. I saw Jesus do that. Boy, and I did this, and I did that in his name. Oh, yes, I must be the greatest in the kingdom. And then over here you have Andrew. He said, no, 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 I brought people to Jesus. No, no, I must be the greatest. Peter speaks up, hey, hey, who tells me that I'm the rock? that upon this rock he shall build his church. Ah, I must be the greatest. And remember what what Peter did also. He he was the longest walker of water in the world's history. Praise the Lord. He walked on the water. You know, I must be the greatest. You have John and James, and they speak up, hey, 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 who's related to Jesus? We're his cousins. Oh, we must be the greatest. And then it goes on and on and on. So this is a good discussion amongst the disciples, not about the right things. They focus and emphasize on themselves rather than on Jesus. They focus on themselves rather than other people. They think they are the the greatest in the kingdom, but in all reality, Jesus is going to show them that they're not. Notice with me what Jesus does. Verse 47, And Jesus, perceiving the thought of their heart, took a child and set him by him, and said unto them, Whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me, and whoso shall receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. He says, no, 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 you're you're missing the point. The greatness of a person is not how much you think you are important. No, no, no. The least is the greatest in the kingdom of God. Those who are humble in the kingdom of God. Think about it with me. If you focus on yourself, if you have more and more pride about yourself and who you are and what you have done, you are very similar to another individual that said that, when he fell. And that's none other than the devil. In Isaiah chapter 14, verse number 12, it says, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, 
which didst weaken the nations. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the signs of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. I, 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 I. So Satan himself is saying, look at me. Aren't I impressive? Aren't I the greatest? Now, think about it with me. Greatness does not come with pride. But it comes with humility. That's what we see in Jesus Christ. Jesus himself says you have to be humble like that of a child. And whoever get, receives a child in my name receives me. The least amongst them, they are the greatest. Not those who think they are. The pride of man produces a quite uh, hardship of results. A lot of times in my life, I have found that God likes to humble me when I get too much on myself. For instance, for those who don't know, I was the supervisor and eventually manager at the South Lake Hospital Food Service. And so, I was in charge for certain areas. One day, I went into the cafe area and my director was talking to somebody and he looks over at me and says, hey, I need somebody to refill the spinach container. And I said, no problem, I'll get right on that because this lady has been waiting for a long time. I can't do it, and so I'm asking you to do it. No problem. So I go in there. I go into the, the walk-in cooler. I open the door. I go in there, and I'm looking, I'm looking, I'm looking. Spinach, 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 spinach. Where are you at? Where are you at? Where are you at? I'm in a hurry because I know I have a meeting uh, just in a few minutes, and so I have to help this lady uh, get more spinach on the salad bar. I'm like, okay, okay, okay. Here, this looks like spinach, and so I take it, and I go out there, and I'm saying, oh, I'm so sorry, ma'am, for the wait, and, and all of a sudden, I realize, that's not spinach. <laughs> oh, no, no, that's basil. <laughs> basil looks very similar to spinach, except for it is connected to a stem, and so I'm like, oh, boy, this is not going to be good, so she's already upset that we didn't have spinach in the first place. Now, she's doubly upset because the idiot manager doesn't know that this is not spinach. And so I put it right back. I said, I'll be right back. And so I, you know, God likes to humble me at certain, certain times. Sometimes <laughs> I get humbled here as the pastor. A few times ago, I, uh, I was uh, preaching. I thought I was doing a really good job. Uh, then all of a sudden, after the service, I go back to see the recording that we usually put up on YouTube later in the day. And guess what I forgot? To turn on my mic. And so, if you'd notice me, uh, in the beginning of the scripture reading, I was going to look to see, is that, is that mic on? <laughs> God likes to humble me many different times. Why? Because I have a lot of pride in me. If you knew me back when I started here, uh, I, I believe that I have had such a great transformation because when I first got here, I thought I had all the answers. Why? Because I had a degree. I had a Master's of Divinity. Mm. Doesn't that sound amazing? You know? Then I learned quickly that I did not have the answers. But being so proud, I did not ask the right questions. So God has humbled me throughout my time here and continues to humble me. Why? Because of my pride. Each person, I believe, has this innate desire for self-importance. Now, what, I'm, what I mean by that is that we want to be number one. But in all reality, number one spot should be given to the Lord. It should be the Lord Jesus Christ, God of the universe, rather than little old me. So when things don't go your way, perhaps, God is saying, hey, you might want to humble yourself before me. Sometimes it's just, it's just what happens in this fallen world. We go through different difficulties, and sometimes it is to purges of things that we have in our lives uh, that is, should not be there, or it is to uplift the material that is there to make the gold into uh, pure, purified gold without the, the dross on it. 
So first of all, we see the very fact that Jesus humbles, the humble is the greatest in the kingdom rather than the proud. So the disciples had this pride about them that they wanted to be the greatest. And Jesus refers to them and says, nope, you are not the greatest. It's interesting. The pride of man is the number one sin, I think, in every person's life is I want to be number one. So the question for each one of us, is that true about us? Is that true in our own lives? Depends how you treat one another. It is so natural for us to think about ourselves rather than another person. For instance, you, you go home and there's things that need to be done. And you'll say, ah, oh, my spouse will take care of that. I need to go and do whatever. Maybe watch some sports. You know, today is one of my favorite days uh, in that today is the, the I, I don't know one will ever care about this, but it's important to me, so I'm going to throw it out there. Uh, today is the championship of the NASCAR season. Okay, if you don't care, just tune that out for now. Uh, but I'm excited about that. But do I go home and see, oh, Laura will take care of all the things that, uh, that I could take care of, but I'm too busy watching NASCAR. Now, I don't watch NASCAR. I watch a really quick replay of the entire thing. I'm like, okay, that's easy. But think about it. Do I have the humility to say, hey, do you need help? Hey, maybe I can do this for you. Or I can do that for you. Maybe it's, it's just being nice to the people out in the world. We're, we're all about our getting what we need to do in order to get home. But maybe, oh, can I help you? Be nice to them. Show forth the kindness of Christ. Humility is the number one thing that we ought to do. In Philippians chapter number 2, my favorite portion of Scripture talks about humility in a great way. Notice with me in Philippians chapter 2, starting in verse number 1, it says, If there be, therefore, any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels and mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that ye be like-minded. Notice this. Having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind, let nothing be done through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Why? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. If we are prideful, we need to repent and say, Lord, make us more like Jesus. With the humility that Christ had, with the humility of thinking of others rather than ourselves, may that be our prayer today if we find ourselves that we have pride in our lives. Number two, not only is there uh, folk emphasizing on ourselves rather than others, but number two, emphasizing judgment over salvation. Turn back over with me, Luke chapter 9. There's an f- emphasis of judgment over salvation. Notice with me, Luke chapter number 9. We n- notice in verse number uh, 51 now, And it came to pass when the time was come that he, that's Jesus, should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus Christ, knowing the will of God for himself, is going to Jerusalem. In about six months, he is going to die. And he knows this quite well. So he's set in his face toward Jerusalem. He is going straight towards Jerusalem. And he's actually going through Samaritan territory, which is something that he does, but no other Jew would do. Notice with me what it says uh, in verse number 52. And sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of Samaritans to make ready for him. They did not receive him because his face as though he would go to Jerusalem. Here we have a, a specific remark that he's in Samaritan territory. For those who don't know, Samaritans are half-breeds. The Jews would say uh, that they are Jews that intermarried with the heathen of the land, and now they're their own different uh, ethnic properties there. 
They have their own religion. They do not uh, go by the law of Moses, by the Torah, by, by the Pentateuch, or anything like that of the Old Testament. They have their own Pentateuch, the Samaritan Pentateuch. So they think that they have their own religion. They have their own ethnic properties. Now Jesus is the Messiah of the Jewish people. He is going through Samaria uh, because of the very fact that he is going straight to Jerusalem they are offended by him. They don't want him to be there. So they say, no, you can't stay here. You can't stay here. Well, do you know who this is? He's the Savior of the world. He's the Lord, Lord, King of Kings. Don't you know who this is? They don't care. They want him gone. But here's what his disciples said. Verse 54, and when his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that, will, that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did, or Elijah? So, the next time that you get angry with somebody, oh, I just want to just bring down fire from heaven against them. You know, that's not a good thing to have. Judgment! Oh, yeah, we, he, they reject you, Jesus. Oh, we're... Give us the command and we'll, we'll call down fire to destroy this entire town. Is that really what, Eli what Elijah did? No. What Elijah did, I love the story of Elijah on the Mount Carmel experience. He knows that the nation of Israel at that point in time is full of idolatry, full of worship of Balaam and Baal. And so, okay, he then gives a challenge saying to the prophets of Baal, prophets of Ashtoreth, and all those. And he says, no, no, come to Mount Carmel, and we'll see who, who's, who the real, true God is. So they all came. And they said, okay, here's what we'll do. You take a, a, a heifer, a, a sacrifice for yourself, and put it on the altar, and whoever calls and the answers by fire is the true God. So you go first. So they go ahead and do it, and they... Throughout the day, try to call on Baal to bring forth fire. Come on, Baal, let's bring forth fire. I don't know exactly what they said, but they went through the day, nothing. Not even a little bit of something. Then Elijah comes and says, okay, I'm going to rebuild the altar of the Lord. And he rebuilds the altar, commands dozens and dozens of gallons of water be produced on that altar. And then he prays. And I love what he prays. It gives the reason why he's doing this. It says, And it came to pass at that time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that thou art God in Israel and that I am thy servant and that I have done all these things at thy word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that Thou art the Lord God, and that Thou hast turned their heart back again. Revival. That's His main, main address. And when He prayed that, fire came down from heaven and destroyed the sacrifice, destroyed and licked up all the water. Water is gone, and as well as the rocks themselves are gone showing how tremendous a display of power that is. Wow. But Elijah didn't want to send fire upon people that aren't right with God. Rather, he wanted his own people to get right with God. That's the main difference. John and James, they're called the, the sons of thunder. They want, they want punishment right now. These people don't know who you are, and so we're going to destroy them. Here's what Jesus says. He rebukes them. Verse number 55. And he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of. For the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. Jesus is all about salvation, not about judgment. He did not come into this world to declare judgment. That's the second coming. His first coming is to bring forth grace, bring forth truth, to show forth who God is and what God is like. 
And so he went through the entirety of the area that he has, healing people, showing the love of God uh, through him by miraculous works, teaching the word of Christ with authority, the word of God with authority and power so that everybody will know this is the Messiah. This is him. This is it. He does not want to destroy men's life. He wants to redeem them. Each and every person has a possibility to be saved. Everybody that comes into the world all have the same problem. We are all sinners by nature because of Adam and Eve. They fell in the garden. And because of that, we all, like them, are sinners. We show it in different degrees of how bad we are. But yet even one sin committed against God forfeits our ability to go to heaven. But God, so rich in mercy, but God so loved the world that He sent His Son into the world so that He would die for all of us. Whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. Jesus is all about salvation. Judgment will force to be happen. Yeah, that's true. If those who reject Jesus, they will be judged. But that's not the sole purpose of what Jesus is doing. He wants them to have life. Them themselves, they reject Jesus. But He wants them to be saved. For us, there's a lot of people that are wicked in the world that we say, oh, may, may God just punish those evildoers. To a, a degree, yeah, according to our justice system, yeah, I suppose. You know, those who murder, they should go to jail. And if you go with what the Bible says, they should be executed. Whether it be lethal injection or whatever. Uh, electric chair and all that. Now, this is not the place where we're going to have a debate about it or anything like that, but just saying, biblically speaking, a life for a life. But here's the thing about it. How much do we pray for our enemies? How much do we love our enemies so much that we want them saved? Uh, remember in Haiti, there's a gang of 400 individuals that have kidnapped 17 missionaries, including little children. We want them to get out alive. Amen. We want them to be safe. Amen. But maybe through this time, instead of praying for judgment against those who have kidnapped them, maybe we pray, may they get to the, understand who Jesus is. Maybe they will be turned from their wicked ways into the, the kingdom of light. Perhaps this is why they kidnapped these individuals, that those individuals will show forth the love of Christ, the light of the world to these individuals, and they'll get saved. Perhaps that's true. Perhaps that's the reason why this is all come about. Let us pray for that. But for our lives, may we seek salvation for each person that we see. Whether that person is for us or against us, may we seek for out salvation for every person that we meet. Number three, last but not least, the last emphasis that the disciples have that Jesus rebukes is number three, that they emphasize comfort over God's will. They emphasize comfort over God's will. Notice with me in verse number 57 now. And it came to pass that as they as Jesus and the disciples, went in the way, a certain man said unto him, Lord, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. Doesn't that sound good? Like, Lord, I'm going to follow you no matter what. But what the kid is thinking, you're going to become king, and I want a piece of that kingdom. I want to be one of the rulers in the kingdom. So yeah, I'm going to go wherever you want me to go. And he has to break the news. Um, verse number 58 and Jesus said unto him, Foxes have holes, birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have not where to lay his head. In other words, Jesus does not have a home here. He goes through areas, 
And he sends his disciples into an area to see if there's anybody that would hold them. He doesn't have a house. You know, I have a house, and it's a rather nice one. We praise the Lord for that. We used to be living up in the, uh, the church apartment, uh, but now the Lord blessed us with a house. Praise the Lord. Here, Jesus doesn't have a house. He doesn't even have an RV. You know, some people have RVs. That's pretty cool. Um, but he doesn't even have that. He is absolutely a homeless man. Going through area to area to area, people will then open up their houses to him to come and stay. But if this person wants to follow Jesus by what he's going to get after Jesus and get all the riches or whatever from the kingdom of God, he has another thing entirely to spoken to him. It's not going to happen because Jesus is going to die. He is not going to set up his kingdom right now. This person thinks so. No, no, I'm going to go wherever you want me to go. It's to death. Oh, well, huh. maybe not, not everywhere. <laughs> uh, I, I draw my line at that, right? Here, comfort over that of God's will. Notice with me, verse 59. And he said unto another, follow me. But he says, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. The request is very simple. He is not only asking permission just to go home uh, and bury his father because his father just died. No, it's wait until his father died to bury him. That's what he's asking. That's what he's going for. No, okay, okay, I'll, I'll follow you just after this part's done. I'll follow you when it's convenient for me. I'll follow you when everything gets settled. Let me just do that first. And he says, um, verse 60, And Jesus said unto him, Let the dead bury the, their dead, but go thou and preach the kingdom of God. Another one, verse 61, And another said unto, also said, Lord, I will follow thee, but let me first go bid the them farewell, which are at home at my house. And Jesus said unto them, No man having put his hand to the plow, looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the example of what he's given. Pretend I'm a farmer. No, I'm not a good farmer. <laughs> I would be a terrible farmer. Uh, one thing that me and Laura really wanted was land with a house on it, so that we can make our own vegetables and all that. Well, I learned by just mowing the grass that we have at, at the house. I'm allergic to outdoors, okay? I have allergies like nobody's business, and it affects my asthma. And so I would be a terrible farmer, but pretend I'm a farmer. What I would do is I would have this plow, okay? And the plow would be used in such a way you would guard and guide the, the plow to make sure that your rows are straight on your property, but what he's saying is those who put their hand to the plow and you're going forward, but you're looking back. You're going forward, but you're looking back. You're doing a terrible job of, of being straight. You're just looking back. You're not fit to be a plowman. You're not fit to be a farmer. The same way, if we concentrate and focus on what we don't have or what we are missing out of because we're saying yes to God's will, then we're not fit for the kingdom of God that our work is, will be in vain. But may each one of us say, God's will be done in my life no matter what happens to me. No matter what happens to me, may God's will be done in my life. Each one of these focuses and these emphasis that the disciples have, they're wrong to have, but may we concentrate and fulfill all the good things that Christ has shown us us in his word, that we should be humble, and that we should uh, have and focus on salvation rather than judgment, and we should focus on God's will rather than the conveniences of our life. May that be the encouragement for the, this day. I'm going to ask Wanda to come to the piano, and we're going to have a time of prayer. If the Lord has, has touched your heart about some issue in your life, uh, whether it be about your pride or about wanting to be more humble or whether it be that you want to share forth the, the gospel more and more in your life or whether it be that you just want to do God's will. We'll have a time of prayer between us and God right now. And as Wanda plays, let us just go before God. 
repent where it's necessary, and then give God the glory by dedicating ourselves to Him. Let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank You so much for this time that You have given us. We ask You right now just to help us to pour out our hearts before You. Help us to forsake wicked ways. Help us to go on to the way that You would have us to do. I do pray in Jesus' name. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time that we can meet with you. And Father, we ask you just to help us to do what you would have us to do. Help us to fulfill our, the will that you have for our lives. Father, whether it be to whoever it is that we want to witness to, to show forth and share the love of Christ to them, may it be done for all of us who you help with humility, help us to be humble. And Father, we thank you so much for this time that we could spend with you. May we dedicate this next week for you, for your kingdom. I do pray in Jesus' name. Amen.